This is the How Goods Innovation Online Series. Uh, today we're going to hear about regenerative poultry and a bunch of other stuff, including an indigenous perspective on as many things as he wants to tell us about today. Uh, and um, uh, the basic outline is we'll have an intro, um, we'll have a sh uh, thought leader conversation for about 30 minutes. Uh, then we'll do brief interactive community breakouts where you get a chance to connect with other people here uh, and ask them questions. Uh, and then we'll come back together for a Q&A um, with Reginaldo at the end. Um, just before we start, I wanna let you know there's a couple other awesome talks coming up. Um, Junjo Lee from Google uh, will be presenting on the anthropology of food. She's a food anthropologist uh, and does really fascinating research on food. Um, and then Julia Collins uh, from Regenerative Food from Planet Forward, she'll speak on regenerative food. And that's going to be part of the next um, season and series that we're putting on, which is really focused on product development and how do you, uh, how do you create products from a regenerative, from a biodiversity perspective. So that's about it. Uh, we're going to head back over and say hello, uh, Reginaldo, welcome. And uh, maybe just introduce yourself, say, uh, yeah, I don't know, any way you want to introduce yourself to get us started here. Claro que sí, mucho gusto. I'm Reginaldo. I'm from Guatemala. I was raised in the rainforest of Guatemala with um, a lot of really good stuff that now seems to have popped up all over the world as a, as innovations, uh, though they're really not. I mean, uh, some of us just grew up this way and that's the way we always did agriculture. So I'm here to share with you some of this um, uh, um, work we do and how we have approached um, this uh, work of regenerative agriculture as a lifetime commitment to restoring the earth and I'm not even the one who started any of this. this. I'm like the fourth generation working on these kinds of um, ways of being, thinking, learning, interacting with other, other life forms on earth and to ensuring that we all have a home to live healthy lives and productive lives and where we become, uh, we can become as the, the fullest expression of ourselves uh, and allowing every other expression of life to also become a full expression of itself. So there is the indigenous uh, approach for you right there. Well, <laughs> you just summed it up. You could just drop the mic and we're done. If everybody could fully understand what Reginaldo just said, that would be, you know, that would be enough. We wouldn't need to talk anymore. Um, will you share a bit more of your story as a farmer, as an agronomist? What led you to kind of choose the path that you're now walking on? Um, really is a, okay, so, once I answered that question by saying, um, my community raised me that way. And um, uh, so it was, I was made by the community. And that was asked during an interview like this, which got a lot of attention. And the, the interviewer corrected me when I answered it that way and said, um, so I, I, I beg to disagree. I don't think that is true. And I said, what makes you think that? I said, I think you're a unique individual. Or if not, then tell me, is your whole community doing what you do? And the truth is that, yeah, that is not true. Um, there were about 216 or 20 of us young people going to school uh, together in different places. And um, of course, the rest of them couldn't do the same things because most of them got killed by the army. It was only possible because I had plenty of mentors that did help out. So um, I don't know if if um, there will be many others who would have followed the same because most of them got killed. Um, but I would trust that they many would have, and that's that's kind of where where I came from. Thank you. Thank you for sharing the story, and it's so important to uh, not gloss over it and to not forget what's happened to your community and, and other communities around the world that have faced this sort of, um, as you described, uh, oppression and destruction of that, of that resilience, of that uh, food producing, of the wisdom and community that you were raised in. And yet it seems that in your 
life, you have somehow managed to, to keep some seeds alive uh, and to find ways to offer and, and mentor others um, in some of what you've learned along the way. And yeah, I'm curious to hear a bit more of, yeah, how did that happen? And, and how is it that, you know, part of, when I first met you, you were very focused on the education and, uh, and teaching other people. And it seems like that's still a part of it. And yet you're also now have regeneration farms and are taking a slightly different angle. So yeah, I'm curious if, you, if you'd be willing to share any more of that sort of that journey. Right. And, uh, yeah. And it is not about different angles and all of that. Here's the thing. Um, the work I do is really about systems change. Now, if you understand systems change, you will know that you can't change a system by going around and beating it all over the place uh, in different places. You got to start and focus, concentrate your firepower in a single spot. But if you pick the wrong spot, it also just uh, doesn't do anything either. So you got to pick that spot with very strategic principles and strategies. And so strategy is at the end, the name of the game, whether it was the insurgency in Guatemala or whether there is a food intellectual insurgency, it's got to be structured within those same system level fundamental principles of change and what changes things and what is just noise and a lot of uh, whitewashing. So for me, it was about picking what is the entry point. Um, and if you step back a couple of a couple of yards, even you will see that what we were doing uh, way back, and I understood this at a young age, because it was explained properly uh, by our elders, why we did things the way we did. The why was, is, was 100,000 years ago, and will be a million years from now, still the same. Uh, why did we do that? Um, well, because of the way nature works. Nature hasn't changed. Nature will continue. We mess with it, yes, but the biophysical and chemical processes of the earth have been the same for billions of years. And even if we manipulate them and create cocoons where we actually make those, you know, manipulate those processes, nature is always gonna revert back to its geoevolutionary blueprint. That we understood. I understood at a very young age, not specific terms, but, and not in English for sure, but, uh, I understood that the way we work with nature has worked forever, will work forever, unless nature itself changes the biophysics and the chemistry on how it operates. Then, yes, but before that, it's going to be good. So, fast forward, and, you know, I'm back into working with this uh, with, within the United States and within the challenges of having lost all of that ancient knowledge here, and... Um, it just came handy. I, I got a degree in agriculture, yes, but I always was reconciling the science with the wisdom that we were inherited. And to me, just a little bit of that science was enough. Uh, I didn't need much more of that. Knowledge actually is the way we're destroying the world. It's actually what's given us the tools to destroy the world. And because we use knowledge primarily rather than combining it with some of that wisdom, and that understanding and that indigenous view of the world. And so to me, a little bit of knowledge, uh, by the time I finish ag school in Guatemala, that's all the knowledge I really needed to be a top regenerator in the country because basically everything else was just uh, fluff. It was just hot air. It was just ex extraction systems and that kind of stuff that had no use in my, in, in my purpose of actually just working with nature. So. If you fast forward that to what we're doing now, the bottom line was we are not engaged in producing poultry. Poultry, we picked it because it just happens that in order to work in a way that is regenerative, you need to put animals, the intestinal tract of animals, organisms back into the process. Basically, if you look at it, we don't produce things uh, as farmers. Um, we actually just uh, are engaged in the stewarding of energy transformation. That energy is transformed from non-edible forms in the CO2 forms, uh, in the, you know, ammonia in the air, to nutrients in the soil, to water and, and other things that, that, you know, for the most part, except for water, we can't just drink or eat. It's got to be transformed. And so the, the way that energy is transformed is pretty simple. 
the first place where there is the, the mass transformation is in the photosynthetic process. And the more photosynthetic area you have in a space, the more of that energy transformation you're going to achieve and the more profitable your farm is gonna be at the end of the day, because at the end, what you market is harvested energy that is in the form of edible, edible forms, right? So you start from that massive, Im immense and almost endless free energy out there, right? That's the first place of transformation. The second one is in the, um, in the biology of the soil, right? So if you, don't, if you have a poor soil, your energy transformation just completely stalls. Um, this is where chemical inputs are so, so detrimental to the profitability from a fundamental indigenous perspective. That's how you shoot yourself in the foot uh, because you destroy the very foundation of energy transformation, which is the foundation of our business as farmers, which is to harvest the excess energy that expresses itself in edible forms like eggs and fruits and vegetables and so on. Now, you shoot yourself in the foot if you destroy that ecology in the soil. So that's the other place where massive amounts of energy are transformed from non-edible into edible forms. Some of them edible for other organisms, some of them edible for a plant. So just don't take this uh, from a homocentric perspective. That's another thing of being indigenous is that you don't put yourself in the center. When I said edible, it's edible in a chain reaction, not edible for us. Don't look at it homocentrically. So the other thing is that um, the other place where that energy is transformed massively, the third major area, and this is the one that really matters for us to design farms uh, that are regenerative is the, the, the intestinal tract of all of the organisms of the earth. If you really think of the earth as a whole ecosystem at an ecospherical uh, standpoint, the, tra the, the, track of, the intestinal tract of animals is a fundamental energy um, uh, processing infrastructure that, that has existed forever and is responsible for taking cellulose, uh, whether it's in the form of grasses for cows or in the form of, um, you know, highly tight, um, you know, nutrient packages like grain for, for chickens or sprouts, you know, a sprouted grain or just uh, forages in the field where the chickens roam for our case, all of that. Uh, may not be edible for us, but if you put that through the intestinal tract of an animal, you know, you not only get the animal and the byproduct of the animal, because now you got meat and eggs and beef and all kinds of other things that is a byproduct of that energy transformation process, but also you get that original raw material, cellulose or whatever, and now within 48 hours, it has gone from being non-edible to a plant to becoming accessible to a plant in the form of manure. And if that is done straight in the open landscape, now you got just regenerated, you got the capacity to regenerate massive amounts of other levels of energy transformation, which is the biological. Now, so animals are central. Without the animal, you really are dealing with nine months of decomposition for a cellulosic mass that you may take out of your garden, uh, your, chicken, your kitchen, you put it in the compost pile and nine months later, you may see soil. Uh, but yet, you know, with the animal intestinal tract, you can do that within 48 hours. And so that is massively critical in the efficiency of energy transformation as the true measurement of efficiency in farming. It's not about yield. It's completely about energy in, energy out, and energy that you keep for the next cycle. And in those processes, what you see is that you harvest very little of the energy, 30, 40 percent according to some of the scientific research that has been done by Chico University and other uh, experts at this. And so you end up with 70% of all of the energy that you actually were able to capture in the system as seed, as a seed uh, savings account for the next energy cycle, for the next uh, crop cycle. And so fundamentally, a systems change theory has to factor all of these things. And for us, the systems change theory from a four-dimensional perspective four-dimensional meaning that you look at the land three-dimensionally. So in, I don't see a farm as a, as a flat surface or, 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 you know, a, what is it? One, yeah, um, like a, a flat know, land, like just two dimensions. Right. No, to me, a, a, an acre is, is in excess of like 1.7 uh, million cubic feet and starts at uh, 12 feet underground and ends on the top of the tallest tree. That's, energy transformation landscape I'm dealing with. And photosynthesis is the first thing. 
but down in the ground is the, is the next big thing. And whatever is in the middle, helping that cellulosic, larger, more complicated molecular structures break down so that then, the, then it can be become available. The elements of it, the sugars in the cellulose, for example, can become available to microbes. So then they can manufacture nutrients for the plant. That is critical. And for us, the critical element of systems change was people. And if you think of consumers and farmers, over 500 million farmers own less than, than, than 10 hectares around the world. And every farmer, no matter what size, can, can engage with poultry, but not with all the other animals. So if it's about people, and it's also central that you have animals, nothing beats um, you know, the small farmer and the chicken as the foundation of a massive global scale theory of change. That's why we do chickens. And so the regeneration farm question really isn't really about a business. We are building an ecosystem of enterprises, nonprofits, and partners, investors, and so on. It's about an ecosystem. So you're going to find me at my farm now that I was finally able to get a farm, 75 acres next to where I live now. Now I will have a farm, but that farm isn't my business. That's part of an ecosystem. The enterprise regeneration farms is critical because we need an aggregator that can then allow us to have ownership and control of the supply chain, which is central to regeneration. Remember what happens on the farm is the result of how the system distributes wealth, creates and distributes wealth. If you didn't distribute the wealth, then the farmer is not gonna be able to do what is needed on the farm. And so the farm is the tail end, but it isn't, I mean, we have, in our homocentric reductionist and whitewashing culture, colonizing culture, we have reduced regenerative thinking to little things like no till and soil health, <laughs> and really myopic definitions like that, when really is it's about the whole ecosystem, but it starts with ownership, control, and governance so that the things on the farm can actually become materialized. That is really what it means. That's why I, I, I step back for you so you can take the whole picture now you see why regeneration farms is critical, but also the Regenerative Agriculture Alliance, also my farm and the other 15 farmers that we are now part of the Regenerative Poultry in our, in our region and so on. So hopefully that gives you a better picture of, of what we're doing. Here. <laughs> it's amazing. I think I just got a couple semesters worth of uh, you know, high level insight into uh, agriculture, systems change. Uh, it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for laying it all out. Um, one thing I want to pick up that you sort of touched early on and then came back around to at the end was about language. You said something like, well, I understood it, not necessarily in English, but I understood it. And English is a, itself, it's a bit of a Frankenstein language. It, it doesn't in some ways have um, uh, an indigenous origin in and of itself. It kind of got smashed together together from a bunch of other languages as conquerors were coming together. And there's something about English that sometimes, in my understanding, stops us from being able to hold this larger uh, systems change perspective that you're coming from. And so, and you kind of brought it back around to say, well, now, you know, people say regenerative agriculture is, you know, did you no-till? Did you uh, cover crop? Did you, they make it like a simple little checklist of things. Um, and that loses the depth uh, and the potential that can come from it. So I, I'm just curious if that's, if you see that also, if there are ways in which you see our language, uh, in, the English language especially, but language in general, sort of like trapping us in, uh, in our desire and our movement towards a more whole regenerative approach. Yeah, but don't blame it on the language. The language is in the issue. Um, those are two. I'm using English right now to communicate to you a way of thinking and a culture. It's a way of being, knowing, understanding, working with, interacting with, with each other and with life on earth. I mean, that's really, I can tell you that in English. And that is a decolonized concept. The language isn't the problem. The problem is the mindset. With the colonizing of the mind, which has been going on for, according to Sherry Mitchell, over 3,000 years, uh, that is the problem. Uh, and so when you use a language uh, as the foundation of a colonizing culture, then of course that language becomes the tool of colonization. And if you become a colonizing, you, 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 you use that that way, then you're gonna break it down into tidbits, into sound bites, into manipulation, into misinformation, disinformation. You're gonna use that for the purpose of colonization, including colonizing concepts as vast and as original as the idea of regenerative. So in the, 
in in where I come from, regenerative is not a a way of farming. It's not a way of working with the land. Regenerative is a way of thinking. It's a way of being. It's a way of relating to our ancestors and their knowledge. It's a way of honoring their work so that we could have a living world, so that we could still have uh, biodiversity on Earth, uh, so that we could relate to other beings, and so that we could then understand our role in the current state where we live today, so that we can then uh, work with these resources that we are borrowing from, from our are those that protected them for us in the past so that we can inherit them into the future generations. That is regenerative ag agriculture. It has nothing to do with a lot of it's being said out there. Now that's an indigenous concept. Now I can tell you that in English, it doesn't have to be, the language doesn't have to be the problem. Right. The problem is if I were to, if you demand that I just tell you, just tell me what it is so I can go do it. That is different and that is appropriation. And then, so if you think of the colonizing process, um, the, the colonizer comes in, they discover things, whether it was Christopher Columbus or someone else today discovering finally that there is an indigenous way of doing things which native communities have protected around the world, which now somebody discovered and now called it regenerative. Uh, that is the first step of colonization, discovering something that you want. The second step is naming it so that you can then appropriate it, expropriate it, and then exploit it. And that's what has gone on primarily by the nonprofit corporate uh, uh, stratosphere and also the, 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 the large scale corporations that found value in it now want to exploit it and they can't exploit it without naming and appropriating it. So they redefine it to their will, uh, not respecting the foundational principles and the foundation origin of it, because that is not in the colonizers uh, uh, toolkit. And so then you use language for that purpose. The third thing is to establish infrastructure so that you can then manage that ownership and control that you acquired and that you expropriated from the original holders of it, whether it's the land of native people or these concepts like regenerative. Um, so you named it, yes. I mean, Rodial may have named it, but he did because he was colonizing a space that was not his. Uh, that's really, really critical to put right on the table because otherwise good intention, good intended people are making massive mistakes and contributing to the degeneration of the planet in the name of regeneration. So that is, is the next step of, of colonization. You build that infrastructure. So when we see labels coming out, when you see certification systems, but they don't actually represent the foundational origin and they didn't even care to consult that, that's the next stage of colonization. And then the, the, the next stage after that is that you set up infrastructure to defend that space. And that's what's now being the, the, all the positioning of the different forces in regenerative. That's what they're doing, defending and the defending their own concepts or whatever. And then eventually you don't differentiate anymore uh, between what was and what could have been a really incredible, uh, you know, uh, lifetime opportunity, maybe even multi-generational opportunity to do the right thing. And by then, that's what we call colonization of the mind. By then, you really can't see anymore what it was. And that's what we are in so many areas. And yes, when you use language to do that, then you use the language to colonize. But that's an intentional so, thing we do. Uh, can we, so uh, there's so many different paths that we could go given that situation as, as you've just laid it out. Should we um, ditch regenerative as a term and, and move on to something that expresses it better? Should we look at how might we decolonize regenerative? Is that even a, a worthwhile thing to do to, to work on the decolonization of even the word and the approach of regenerative while still using regenerative agriculture uh, and sort of putting that in opposition to some of the, as you described, extracted, um, banalized, you know, oversimplified versions of regenerative? Or uh, I don't know, what, what's, the, what's the approach from your perspective? And it's not really about an approach. It's really about education and what we call conciencia. Um, it's, it's an issue of, of attitude and, a, and, a, and especially it's an issue of purpose. So um, if you came into this space for the purpose of finding a different way to engage consumers and grow your company, I mean, unless you change that, nothing is going to change. And, and, and we're not going to 
I'm not interested in fighting somebody misusing regenerative. It's not, regenerative works. It simply works. It doesn't matter whether you call it regenerative or not. Regeneratively simply is. You can't make it work or not, right? So our farms work and regenerate. And yes, there is a need for building proper governance structure so that that, that expression can be carried through. But it is, a, I mean, especially in this country, it's gonna be literally, we need an insurrection, a real insurrection, a intellectual insurrection. And yes, I think we are at the beginning of some of that and that could, that approach could work. Um, that I mean, I'm writing a book right now, it's called Michael Rising. Uh, an eco-insurgents handbook. And we are laying out exactly what I'm talking about. And, and the reason I'm like trying to figure out how I share this story with you is because there is this methodical process we have to follow if we do decolonize. And I believe a lot of people in the corporations and nonprofits do want to do the right thing. They just nobody's told them what the right thing looks like. So I am intending on at least putting one version of the right thing out there, just like I'm doing today, but in a more systemic way so that you can actually walk that process as many times as you need. Because today all I'm gonna do is, 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 is shake your neurological connections and, uh, and generate more questions than actual answers because we don't have time for the, all the answers. And um, if you are no, not already, looking at the world the way I'm looking at it, you are not gonna understand a lot of the things I'm talking about and not connect the fact that this is actually what we're doing with the poultry, for example, is allowing us to deal with some of the most pressing economic and social issues that keep farmers from making a living to begin with. So if you wanna look at it from a profitability perspective, it's way better to do actual regenerative than to whitewash it and colonize it. It's actually, counterproductive, even to a corporation. So I think we'll get there because we're going to demonstrate that. But unfortunately, it's climbing up a hill. It's almost like Sisyphus. Every time we walk that rock up, halfway up, somebody comes and rolls it back down. And we're saying, no, 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 this is also you freaking rock. Why don't you just let us put it on the top of the hill so you can see what we mean? Because it's good for you too. That's the foundation of indigenous is that it's not about overcoming anybody, outcompeting anyone. It's simply about allowing the real things, the way nature designed things, to express themselves just like we want to express ourselves as full human beings. That's really what it comes down to. And when you do that, and now there's plenty of scientists who validated the conventional system and the way to destroy the world, they validated that, and now they somehow adjudicated themselves the power to validate whether this works or not. And I keep saying, hey, hey, wait a minute. You no longer have the moral authority to come and say that regenerative works or doesn't. But they're still doing it anyway because um, uh, they are colonizers and they can't resist it. They can't avoid that. But the bottom line is that they are finding out that the better you got ecosystem, the, the more resistant you are to diseases and the more you regenerate after a, a, a problem, the more you put the energy and biology back into the soil and support that, the better your crops do, the more nutrient density, the better flavor, all of those things. It's all like, really? You didn't know that? Uh, really? That's news to you? Uh, I mean, honestly, that's the point we have come down to. And I believe that there is a place now for an actual adult mature conversation about why things work and why things doesn't, don't. And to come to grips with the fact that we keep lying to, yourself, to ourselves and we have, we have actually come to believe our own lies, which is actually the ultimate way of lying because normally we can't lie to ourselves, but now we have actually become to learn to, to think of that, um, you know, our own lies as, as truths. And, and, and that is ultimately, I believe we're coming to terms with that and this recent reckoning with not only the virus, but the racial and the fact that we almost lost our, you know, our right to have a democratic country, all of those things, I think, have put us on a place where we are questioning the foundational ways we think and be and learn and do things. 
And we got a couple of years here where I think this is going to continue to resonate. And my feeling is that yes, maybe we got an opportunity here for some systemic changes, which at the end benefit us all. We're not proposing to turn into another way of, you know, I mean, we're we continuing to produce chickens and eggs and carrots and all of that, but we can do it in a way that, that we can all do better uh, rather than the way we're doing right now, which is a, which is a, is a race to the bottom and to nowhere. Yeah, wow. I mean, some of what you were talking about, um, one of my elders talks about a conscious shock that you need, what you said, I'm just gonna shake up your neurology a little bit. Uh, we're gonna have, you're gonna, it's gonna generate more questions than answers. And that's actually the point, this is a one hour thing. You know, we're not gonna solve everything now, but the value of that conscious shock, almost sometimes how animals can disrupt the farm ecosystem. I graze sheep under the apples in my orchard because I like the disruption that happens and the new potential that comes in after they've moved through. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm curious if there are, there are other places, other opportunities you see. You have a, a tree range poultry. You have this incredible, you know, agroforestry chicken integrated system that many people just look at and say, oh, well, that's just the the practices, it's just the practices he's doing. Though as you've laid out here, it's there, that's just the tail end. There's a whole bigger system and understanding that's behind it that you're working from. But where else do you see opportunities to, um, to move in this direction, either for, for individuals or for small farmers or for large farmers? Like what are the steps both towards regeneration, but then also towards the decolonization that you're saying is essential if you would actually achieve regeneration? If you give me share screen opportunity, I'll show you the diagram of the future if we were to achieve what you just asked. <laughs> okay, you've got it, go for it. Okay, so I'm, what I'm gonna show you is an artistic rendition of a diagram that I asked a, a local artist here to produce for us. You can see that now, right? Beautiful. Okay, what this is, is the organizational chart of a regenerative ecosystem management infrastructure. Amazing. This is what we are aiming for. So what you do this, this is actually, this, are, this is a system that has been preserved just like regenerative thinking was preserved by native communities. And again, separate indigenous from native, okay? Indigenous, we all are. We all are indigenous to the earth. Um, and, we came from the earth, from the elements of the earth. We are made of them, mostly carbon, right? But we are all indigenous to the earth. That's where we belong. Now, when we recognize that and we act on it, then we start thinking differently about everything else because that allows us to see everything else also, not as us in the center on the top, but actually as part of an ecosystem where we are all creatures made out of carbon and where our own biota, all the fungus and all of the microbes in our gut, actually, and in our system, all of those incredible processes we depend on to walk around and to just be organisms are so intrinsically connected to every single other being on earth that we are simply not possible. We can't survive without them, right? Once you see that, then what you, you will start to understand is the, the original foundation of how mycelia is organized, how the universe is connected with, with energy linkages. In fact, if you look at, the, at a picture of the brain, a picture of the universe, a picture of mycelia, and a picture of, say, the, the way the, the cities, small and big cities, and the roads and the connections in between, is the same structure at the end of the day. We're simply putting out this fundamental blueprint we already have in us out there into the infrastructure we built. And so what the native communities have done who have preserved these indigenous ways of thinking and being, again, now native being somebody, some groups of people who grew in specific geographical parts of the earth, right? But kept that indigenous way of thinking, they have reflected this in the governance and the way they built governance and control and, and ownership of all well, the way from land to how they benefited from it. Now, this doesn't allow a colonizing culture to, expro to, to exploit it because the idea was never to exploit it, but to live with quality air and all of that for hundreds of thousands of years. I mean, this is not something that was started a thousand years ago or 
or is as old as our democratic system. This is older than even our own presence on earth. And what this diagram represents that, that ancient way of balancing out the fact that we are born both indigenous and colonizers. And it is the one we feed, the one that takes over. And so communities have for, for thousands of years built infrastructure to, to ensure that things are kept on check so that the 10% that is born with a more colonizing spirit doesn't get free will to take over the rest of say a country like we just almost saw being done in this country. Uh, it's happened, but it doesn't mean it happens because we allow for the infrastructure to be built, the governance and the control systems so that those things are allowed and in fact encouraged um, in a lot of cases. So what this means is what we do is in, in, in the places where this kind of organizing continues to be implemented, and we're talking about over a thousand communities just in Guatemala alone. This is fundamentally the infrastructure that the Zapatistas use, that the Ingas in Ecuador and Colombia. I mean, remember, there is over 370 million um, native peoples on earth controlling over 20% of the land. And that's why we still have diversity. And the reason we have that is because they organize on the basis of infrastructure like this. So basically on the outer perimeter, you got the individual groups of different expertise, different affinity groups. Uh, and, and in this case, if you, can you see my cursor? Yep. Okay. So if you were to think of these three right there, this could be our, our broader group here in southeastern Minnesota. So broilers, egg layers, turkey growers, all poultry, right? So we are three affinity groups within a larger poultry affinity group. Together we generate, we grow, we raise our representatives who understand what we do, how we do things so that they can become part of a governing council for our cluster, right? For our region. And then the same thing can happen a hundred times across the country. And as that happens, then you get clusters all over the place, consuls, and those are fully representatives of everything we stand for, rather than being imposed from the top. And then over here, you could have, say, mid-sized animals, pork, mm. you could have sheep, you could have others who actually have an affinity because their processing facilities are very unique, the way the animals are grazed, and, and, and all of that is very unique. So they got very specific things that they can share and guard, and they create their own Consul and so on and so forth. Over here could be larger animals, beef, bison, and so on. And you take your imagination and you could have as many of this so that every single affinity group gets representation. And also is able to exchange knowledge, exchange this kind of ways of thinking and expand and grow at a scale that got no limits. Just like you didn't have to have, you didn't used to have limits the way the natives managed this whole country. We can't even manage a little portion of it. And then we put the indigenous peoples to demonstrate that they can do something on large scale. I mean, seriously, that's the burden. <laughs> I mean, it's laughable, but yet the colonizer thinks that what they do is on the only scalable thing, right? Okay, this is the way we achieved scale over thousands and thousands of years. The next level is then those affinity groups come together as affinity groups from different areas to elect or to grow new representation until you get to the center, which is technically what we could call in this country, if we got together and we also had the guts to decolonize uh, this landscape, we would have the Regenerative Agriculture uh, Congress of America. And it would not be elected officials, it will not be any of that. It would be an indigenous outgrowth of the original concept of regenerative. And then, you know, I mean, there would be corporate that could buy products from the from these processes. I mean, what I don't know is why wouldn't they want to be part of an affinity group here? Say you get another three here and say, okay, Eco Valley Farms, other folks who are in finance, I uh, get together and they create a cluster of affinity group of investors. And over here are the affinity group of real leading corporate uh, institutions that actually understand what we're doing and want to make profit, but also want to make sure that everybody's taken care of. There is no discrimination whatsoever. It's the most inclusive, time-tested, war-tested system that has persisted and survived almost every attempt at being colonized for as long as we have existed, and we can continue to do that. That is what I call 
regenerative ecosystem management. It's not about the farm. Don't don't relate. Re, don't limit it. Don't reduce it to a farm. It's a system. A system is is, is a whole different thing. So anyway, that's my my presentation to you on answering that question. Can we decolonize? Of course we can. The question is, do we actually want to? Too many yeah. just don't want to give up all the power and all of the influence and all of the control that they already acquired. That is the foundational principle of why um, you colonize in the first place. So why would you give that up? But I can tell you that the why has a very important answer and that is because we all do better. I mean, mm -hmm. what the heck is money worth if you can't enjoy it because you destroy the world and everybody hates you? you know? Yeah, the question becomes, do we have the will to do the hard, difficult work to step on that path and head towards it? Because it's not just like, oh, hey, hey uh, Hinal's got a diagram. We just, now we just do that, right? That's, that's not enough. <laughs> nobody, I hope nobody took a screenshot and now thinks that they have it, right? Um, <laughs> It's regenerative. It will be regenerative. Um, whatever we do with it, um, we can degenerate it, but the concept itself is just the concept itself. It just is. You can't change that. That's the beauty of indigenous ways. Um, so let me ask a, a question from a, a kind of a similar angle, which is if you had a billion dollars to invest, uh, to, and again, money as a, seeing it as a tool, as a resource, not as an ends, not as, you know, the ultimate goal, but as a, as a tool to use, what would you do with a billion dollars? Where would you invest it? Where would you, what would you do with it to, um, I don't necessarily think that Kickstarter scale is the right metaphor because it strikes me that that's from a machine metaphor and not from a living systems one. So uh, what, how would you put that billion dollars to work from your perspective towards the beautiful um, image that you just you know, were um, amazing enough to share a bit with us? It's pretty simple. You heard about money tax, right? Right. So. Think of it not from the traditional understanding of money talks as in controls and imposes and extracts, but rather think of it from the perspective of language. The way we approach the concept of how we use language, just apply the same exact layout I gave you for how you can indigenize the way you use language. You do the same with the money. And I got room for 10 times $2 billion. That's not the issue. We know exactly what to do with it. We know how to put it and where we got the criteria. We got the principles, criteria, indicators and verifiers that allows us to sort through. And there is so much space for capital to go into the right place. It's just that we refuse to accept the right, the, to, to accept to put it into those places that show to have the right principles, criteria, indicators and verifiers. But anywhere we have gone, um, we find um, expressions of this that just are just waiting there for, for, for capital to flow so that they can flourish. The thing is, remember, the world we have today and the money that has been built today was done because somebody, well, thousands of people, millions of people in the past imagined today's world. They imagined what they wanted to do. And they imagine this infrastructure we have from the buildings all the way to the governing structures to, you know, corporations and all of that. They imagine all of that and then they built it. All I have done here is laid out a different imagination. And if we are willing, to do it, that will be the future. If we decide not to build it, then we will have the future we decide to build. Question is, why would you not want to build a beautiful future instead of the kind of destructive, self-destructive system we have today? And Seriously, all we have to do is repurpose almost everything in the infrastructure, restructure a lot of the, a lot of the components where workers should own a processing facility, let the workers own it. What is the problem with that? Why do you want the workers to always be on the bottom so that they can be exploited and they can only operate at 25% of their capacity? Why not just give them ownership of the processing facility so they can operate at 90% capacity 100% of the time because they're not going to be exploited, sick, and deprived of the fundamentals 
to take care of their own health, which at the end, you know, has this impact, this ripple effect all across the supply chain anyway. So it's not like it's more profitable for an individual to go and own and a processor and then treat the workers like crap, you know? So it's not beneficial to anyone, not mm. to them, to the workers. So that's, that's what I'm laying out for you right there in that diagram. And just in the poultry alone, we could invest three, you know, three, four billion dollars right now if we just went and took over the infrastructure that is lying idling from farms all the way through the processing facilities and so on. So yeah, very easy. I mean, and we could do that three times over on every sector from pork to sheep to grass fed beef to, I mean, I could go on and on. So yeah, $2 billion would be a very small amount of money to manage in this concept. Love it. Perfect. Um, so I'd love to uh, hand it over to the audience for questions. If you have a question, you can put it in the chat there. There are some good ones that have come in that I'll, I'll sort of refer back to now um, and anyone else can can uh, pop them in. There's a question from uh, Monica Tata here um, that's sort of it's asking about plant-based nutrition. The sort of there's a shift in interest in plant-based nutrition worldwide, um, and yet uh, you have laid out very clearly the ecosystemic and the systems change benefits and why integrating animals. But she's sort of asking, is that gonna is that sending the wrong message about animal protein and making us think we should keep eating animal protein from the terrible situations it's currently grown in? How do you think about and work with this sort of larger trend of plant-based that's, that's moving in the world? Right, I mean, trends are simply uh, the result of things we come to believe. It doesn't have to be a problem. We make it a problem. So I see, I see extremes a problem no matter what whether you are extreme vegan and you hate those who will eat animals or whether you are an animal eater who hates those who are vegan or it doesn't matter. If you can go into almost every part of our society, all of those extremes are extremely damaging to our ability to be fully human beings. Now, doesn't mean, I, I don't think we need to eat meat to be healthy. I, I don't, find that to be a, a valid argument either. But hell, I grew up hunting in the forest. It was the only source of quick protein we had. We had fruits and all kinds of vegetables and stuff, but the protein was extremely scarce. And so we hunted animals and we built the habitat so that they could reproduce even to an extreme to the point that they would become overpopulated unless we hunted them. And we did that on purpose so that we would have excess energy being transformed into, you know, um, wild birds and wild animals that, that we hunted. We did it with incredible respect and with a full understanding of the fourth dimensional part of regenerative thinking, which is the spiritual. And so we, the, the spiritual is critical. You can't achieve a triple bottom line if you don't start with the spiritual, in fact, uh, because the spiritual is what allows you to understand what a triple bottom line is to begin with. It's almost like being, if you're if you not moving into anti-racism, you really can't deal with, you can't fight racism because you have to look at it completely from the opposite end to see what it looks like. Or decolonizing our infrastructure and ownership and control, you have to first become indigenous because without becoming indigenous to the way you see and feel and talk and all of that, you can't even begin to understand what a decolonized system actually looks like and you'll end up just spinning in the same place all over again. So the same way is how we, are, we have been creating this division, divisive culture of have and have nots, have vegetables or have not vegetables, have meat or have not meat, all those kinds of places. But without the animals, really everything stalls. I mean, this, this is like so massive. That doesn't mean you have to eat them. I mean, I would be happy putting the chickens out there and laying them out, lay, letting them die of old age if that's what people want. But folks who go to the extremes is simply out of ignorance. They don't really understand the fundamentals of the biophysics and the chemistry of nature and the geoevolutionary processes that allows for that energy to be transformed. And that's why they pick those extreme positions. Those such things don't exist in an indigenous way of thinking. So. 
But again, I I'm, I'm not advocating for either veganism or meat eating or any of that. That's up to an individual to decide based on their ancestral roots and their spiritual grounding and all of that. But yes, just like you should not buy a sacred native artifact at Walmart, um, you should never prohibit yourself from going to a community and sharing and having someone share that artwork from that is ancestral to them and sacred to them. And then you compensate them with money if that's what they, they want from you. But it's their decision how they want to be compensated for that. It's the same thing with what we eat because we at the end did evolve eating meat. I mean, we wouldn't have canines otherwise. So it is not like we can deny that it's part of our geoevolutionary blueprint. And it is part of part of us, but it doesn't, doesn't it looks like we got enough scientific knowledge now to understand that it doesn't have to be, that we can evolve into a different kind of creature. Now, just keep in mind, it takes thousands of years to evolve to, for us to lose the canines, just like it took thousands and thousands of years for us to lose some of the organs that we no longer use. I mean, not organs, but some of the parts of our body that are no longer useful to us. Now, not understanding that and demanding that people don't eat meat or that people do this or that, that really is so myopic and so loses the whole concept of who we are as human beings that I just got a problem with just the concept, not with individuals. It's with the culture that has generated such a way of thinking that limits our imagination to such a myopic level. Wow, thank you. Um, oh, there's so many good questions and so not enough time. We're gonna wrap up soon. Um, uh, I, I, I think I wanna basically leave the last to you to basically say, um, what would you leave us with both the folks who are here today and the many others who will listen to it down the road? Where, where do you want to head us or what sort of, um, not final words, because hopefully it's just a start to, you know, kick off that neurology and go looking for more questions, but where would you invite us or direct us um, uh, to, to start or to continue on our, on our journeys towards regenerative agriculture, towards a more indigenous way, as you've described today, of, of seeing and working and interacting uh, with the world of food? Take a step back, resist the urge to do things with the same tools. Brad had a question there about, you know, um, can we really transmit this way of knowing through colonial tools? Again, the tools are simply tools. It's how we use them, what we build with them. That's really what's critical. I mean, we got the internet, we got mass communications, we got skills, we got marketing and management training. We got all of those things. Is to what end do we use them? That's really what matters. And that, to understand that, you really have to step back, rethink everything, and really try to collect your thoughts from a more holistic perspective um, to leave you with some other, you know, uh, synapsis trigger. Think about holistic management and how holistic management was also reduced to the land um, when holistic management was about that ecosystem aspect that I that I laid out for you. It's another area where we really shot ourselves in the foot again. No need to do that, but did we use the colonizing tools to do that. We could have used the same tools to say and to express exactly what I just expressed here with the holistic management concept, which is starts from the very top on the consumer side all the way through to the farm. And it's primarily about value exchanges, just the same way that energy flows freely and naturally and can give us the most bountiful crops with almost no inputs from our part whatsoever, very small amounts of inputs. Same way, wealth is another way that energy flows. And when that energy is disrupted, clogged up and all of that, then the whole system suffers just as well. So totally can use colonizing tools. Um, do, well, let's put it this way. We can totally use tools that have been used to colonize. We can use them for a different purpose. We are the ones, it is our mindset that defines how those tools are used. I'll leave you with that. Thank you, Reginaldo. Thank you so much for everything you've offered. And um, wow, I hope everybody listens to this a couple times over. I know I'm going to. There's so many layers in what was said here that uh, you couldn't possibly have caught on the first time. So thank you uh, a thousand times and um, very much looking forward to having you back again. Gracias. Anytime.
Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye-bye.